Thank you very much, Up. Thanks for the invitation. And I was asked to, to tell you about my experiences being the, the crisis manager, the flu commissioner for, for Belgium, and, and, and highlighting the communication uh, aspects there. These are some of my conflicts of interest over the past 20 years, I guess. It's, it's really uh, a hobby that uh, that flu commissioner thing. Uh, a hobby that uh, a hobby that uh, that flu commissioner thing. WHO said, okay, there will be a pandemic, and that's when the uh, the thing started. And then you have one opportunity to do it right. I mean, day one is so important. Uh, in day one, you start your communication with the press, with the people, and uh, and you have to do it right. I mean, you have to go for one voice, one message. In Belgium, they chose to uh, appoint a non-politician to do that. I mean, I have no party affiliations, and that makes things a little bit, at that time at least, a little bit easier, because you're not, you're not attacked politically, majority, minority. Uh, that doesn't come into play, and that was a huge advantage. The second advantage is that you can play in Brussels the complete naive guy. You have to be omnipresent that first day or the first days so that you attract the media attention, uh, you, you make an agreement with them that you will tell them all, and if they call, you will pick up the phone. When you do that, then you can profit from these early days to, uh, to get complete carpet coverage of the field, and they're not going to search for alternative voices there. And if you do that, that makes things uh, a lot easier. And then you convey the message, and you can do that if you do it that way, that our country is ready for a pandemic. That is a gross uh, overestimation for sure. These first weeks, that's easy street. When you have no opposition and, and everybody needs news and they can come to you for news, you can bring quite a lot of neutral information and it is picked up and, uh, and it, is, it is, well, the news is brought the way you bring it and that is, uh, you can only do that in the, uh, the first couple of weeks or months. And then you have to predict the future. That's hard because the future has not happened yet. Predicting the past is a lot easier. But you have to predict the future in order to, um, to prepare the public. So I said, OK, Belgium, small country, we will also have H1N1 cases. Yeah? When you bring that, it is front page news. When then, a couple of days later, the first H1N1 case arrives in the country, it is the second time that they have to bring that news, so they bring it in a more muted and, I think, appropriate way. But you can only do that when you prepare the, uh, the scene for that. And then you have to say, OK, well, we will have H1N1 deaths. Of course, that would be unavoidable. Uh, I used there Sir Donaldson's uh, quote, where he said that in the UK, by the peak of the epidemic, 40 people would die uh, per day. Uh, at the end of the summer. Okay, 40 deaths a day. I worked it out for Belgium. That would be seven deaths a day at the peak of the epidemic. I used that in the media. Seven Belgian flu uh, deaths per, uh, per day at the peak of the epidemic would be realistic. That is true in every year, even interpandemically. <laughs> that, that, that is very, very conservative. However, talking about fatalities is important because when you say that, people say, wow, what do you mean? People die because of influenza? And that was a necessary step to, uh, to take. And then, of course, a couple of days later, you had the first uh, H1N1 death in the country. And the scene was set, and it was already talked about. Where that were, well, the first that it had an impact, and you have to uh, have to deal uh, with that. I went to the first couple of funerals. You have to be very quiet, sit in the back, um, but but it, it it shows that you care, and and I think that was at that time quite important. And then comes the time, inevitably, that they, they, they're going to talk about you. The flu commissioner is a really a great guy. And then you, then you get the feel-good articles yeah? about, yeah, what does he like? What music does he like? Pictures from my first laboratory when I was 13 years old. Uh, and it, it, it's all feel-good, but when they do that, they also sharpen the axis uh, at, the, uh, at the same time. And then comes, then everything is set about the pandemic, about you. And then you come to the, uh, the, the phase where they're going to be much more critical. And the first one was, the government does not do enough. The H1N1 vaccine will arrive too late, and there will not be enough vaccine. Get it while you can. That was the, that was the first, um, the first 
um, really atmosphere that was created. The, uh, the crux of the, uh, of the campaign was the, the vaccination campaign and many people had, uh, had questions there. So you had to show them that you had, I mean, if, if the, the stockpiles, you had to walk there and walk in the, uh, in the rooms where, the, where you could show them that we have the vaccines. And, and then you had to pick uh, who is going to be vaccinated first. Huh? And then, well, women and children first, whatever. I mean, risk groups, they were important. And then I misused the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the top, top football soccer clubs in Belgium um, inappropriately uh, and against all uh, agreements vaccinated their, uh, they made their soccer players priority people. So I said, I can use that. Because if the, the population really believes that this, this vaccine is so desirable that even the soccer players would be dishonest to get their vaccine, uh, I, I said, okay, I can, I can play with that. So I made a big fuss about this. This is Van Ranst is, uh, is raving mad. Uh, <laughs> but, but it worked. Then the, uh, the 2009 pandemic arrived and there was a lot of interest and that is what happened since. So the interest is uh, scientifically is, uh, is going down. Also, the leadership is changing. And this was a good exercise for a, a big pandemic. I agree. But when we're moving farther away from 2009, that experience is being lost. And well, we're two or three uh, political leaders further down the road. And, uh, and a lot of what was learned in 2009 has been sort of unlearned and, uh, and would have to be invented all. Well, there is still Angela Merkel. Yeah. <laughs> And Apostle House, they're the, they're the mainstays. We, we can always count on that. Kom erbij zitten. Vertel even. We hebben een PCR matrix gedaan, ja. influenza A matrix, die is positief CT 20,7. Wat is de achtergrond van de patiënt? Het is een kindje. Kindje uit Mexico teruggekomen. Ja, hoe oud? Vier jaar. Oké. Dus één patiëntje, die, die hebben we net hier bekeken, is ook door het RIVM bekeken. Uh, Charles heeft even contact met uh, Marion gehad. Matrix positief, ja. knetter positief. Ja, het is met 99 ja. ja, moet je mee uitkijken. Ja, ja. Nou ja, dit is een ergste verdenking. Ja. Ja. Dus we, we, het is net tien minuten dat we het weten, dus. Ja. ja, dus dat zou betekenen dat we de eerste geval in Nederland hebben dan. Nee, nee. Oké, okay. nou goed, dat weten we vanavond. Alle verlovers zijn ingetrokken. Ja, de laatste werkuur voor een vrije dag, altijd zo. Waar is die fles whisky gebleven? Ja. <laughs> je hebt uh, het secretariaat ja, ja, voor de Kamer. Wil je even vragen of Loep nou even de, de fles erbij brengt? Het is vijf uur geweest, dus... Uh... Charles, jou ook een klein beetje? Ja, Charles moet nog aan het werk. Ja, ik ook. Oké, uh... okay, jongens, gezondheid. Oké. Dat we dit goed mogen aanpakken. Na, net na 12 uur gisteravond heeft VWS een orde geplaatst voor 34 miljoen doses. Succes.